good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this um, ICDD uh, public talk by Sarah Kufre on health, safety, and security, the everyday struggles of cabin crew workers in Aerolin, Aerolin Linares, Argentina. <laughs> I hope I say that correctly, Sarah, so you correct me on that. Um, my name is uh, Adira Jaffa, and it is my pleasure to serve you as moderator today. Uh, to start with, please feel free to uh, let us know where you are joining us from, and of course, we see your name. Um, you can also join this conversation on Twitter using the hashtag um, um, ICDD Live and follow us at ICDD Network. Please note also that this event is being recorded and live streamed on Twitter. And uh, I start now by actually giving a very brief overview of this event. We will start first by hearing from the ICDD visiting lecturer, Sarah Kofre, for around 30 minutes. This will be followed up by uh, Q&A quest section, where we want to hear from you um, about any questions or comments that you might have regarding the presentation. You can already start using the chat box to put your questions uh, while Sarah is speaking, but I, I think we can also have an opportunity for you to actually take the floor after the presentation. So let me first just introduce uh, Sarah. First, thank her very much for taking time, actually, for joining us in this event. Sarah is a researcher in the field of labor sociology and a union activist. She's a postdoctoral fellow of the National Scientific and Technical Research Council in Argentina, and she conducts her research at the Center for Labor Studies and um, Research, uh, CEIL. She also teaches which is social science methodology at the Del Salvador University. Um, she combines uh, her academic um, career with a strong involvement in the workers' movement as a shop steward in one of the public sector units in Argentina. And again, I will try to say it correctly, the Asociación de Trabajadores del Estado, ATE. She also participates actively in the Global Labour University Network. She's actually a certified uh, uh, trainer for uh, the online academy, and I'm really, really pleased to have her with us. Um, so, Sarah, over to you, and thanks again. Thank you, Adira, for the presentation. Um, I will share my screen. Um, yeah, okay, so thank you again, Adira for the presentation and for moderating this public talk. Uh, before I begin, uh, I would like again to express my thanks to Christoph Scherer for inviting me to the ICDD and to Florian Dorr and to all the team at the ICDD uh, for all the support and for making this visit possible. And I will also like to thank my colleagues at Sail Concert, where I conducted uh, most of my doctoral uh, research. Well, my talk today is entitled Health, Safety and Security, the Everyday Struggles of Cabin Crew Workers in Aerolíneas Argentina. And it is focused on how cabin crew members organized and resisted the processes of intensified exploitation of their laboring bodies during the first period of the renationalization between 2008 and 2015. And this concept of laboring bodies, uh, which I will refer later in the presentation, is one that I have been working and discussing with my colleague Anne Engelhardt um, from the perspective of uh, social reproduction theory. So the resistance against the intensification of the workload took place through open conflicts when the company tried to modify the collective bargaining agreement and also in the ones that I'm more interested in discussing today through daily struggles. That is, um, that my analysis today will focus on those actions of workers' resistance in which they display certain knowledge 
practices and actions that are part of the union tradition, but not directly driven by union officials, or just uh, put in other words, not organized by the union as an institution. But um, before going directly into that key point, I'd like to bring a little bit of the context um, of this research. Since uh, the emergence of low-cost companies in the 1990s, the aviation industry developed through two types of models, the low-cost carriers or LCC and the full-service carrier or FSC. So low-cost carriers um, are based on flexible hours, precarious contracts and extended working uh, shifts. And as many research, especially in the case of Ryanair, have shown, um, this is the very symbol. This company, Ryanair, tends to be the symbol of this model. However, against the portrait of two absolute contrasting models, um, I identify that the processes of flexibilization, uh, undermining of working conditions, um, are actually part of a global tendency in the air transport, and Aerolíneas Argentinas is not an exception to that. Um, especially during the current crisis in aviation, due to COVID-19 um, containment policies, we can see how uh, this global tendency to uh, flexibilize and undermine working conditions has extended. So we could say that Aerolíneas Argentinas is a case of a full service career um, with well-paid jobs, with labor stability, uh, and a strong union tradition. And its workforce is, is around 10,000 workers. And in the period under study, there were six unions representing, representing sorry, the directly empl um, employed workers. Um, I would just refer briefly that these are all by industry national unions, uh, but the collective agreements are set at company level. So, um, in a very brief summary of the company's history, um, I'd say that Aerolíneas Argentinas follows the history of public companies in Argentina, and it's a national symbol, as well as an example of the privatization process in the 1990s. It was founded in 1950, uh, when civil aviation um, began to flourish and when states uh, encouraged public flag airlines uh, as a strategic tool for, um, let's say, national sovereignty. And it was privatized uh, in the 1990s, being one of the first privatizations uh, taken by the new liberal government of Carlos Menem. And Iberia's private management um, of the company reduced the company's assets, uh, it discontinued routes and carried out massive dismissals of workers, followed by flight cancellations and wage pay suspensions. So the struggle for work continuity in 2001 um, was uh, actually a turning point in the history of uh, workers uh, in Aerolíneas Argentinas and in the whole collective of uh, aviation workers in, in Argentina. And Marsan Group, which is part of Air Comet, took control of the company in 2001 after that long uh, struggle and actually deepened those fraudulent economic policies of its previous owners, leading to a um, rather extension of uh, the crisis. Then in 2006, Nestor Kirchner's administration increased the, ex the percentage of state participation in Aerolíneas Argentinas, as it also did in other uh, privatized public services. And the capitalization plan for um, Aerolíneas Argentinas at that moment included 
a very complex processes of negotiations that I will not uh, refer now. And, and then in 2008, under Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner's first presidency, the company um, was renationalized. So after um, the Congress passed, the Exploitation Act, uh, it remained as a joint stock as it is today, and the state being its uh, greatest shareholder. And the reason why I chose the period 2008-2015 is because in 2015, um, the government had changed, and since Mauricio Macri won the presidency, he introduced not only um, new management in the company, but in, li in, in line with his right-wing government policies, uh, um, he also uh, made and introduced certain changes in the aviation policy, known as Revolución de los Aviones, or Airplane, Airplane Revolution in English, that transformed the domestic market uh, by deregulating fares and allowing the first low-cost companies uh, into the market. Um, the picture you can see in this, uh, in this slide um, was taken during one of the, um, sorry, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, during one of the uh, manifestations of workers um, against uh, those policies. And the cabin crew member who is very proud and smiling is actually wearing the same t-shirt that her mother had worn in 2001 uh, when resisting the company's uh, barn yeah. So um, this uh, picture actually is an important symbol of what I will later uh, explain on the union tradition and the relationship with uh, families. Um, and in the picture, uh, you may not see it very clearly, but it says um, Save Aerolíneas Argentinas and Austral, which is also the same slogan uh, of the flight that uh, she holds and uh, that was used for the, the presentation of, of this talk. So now that I briefly introduced the case, I want to go back into the main question. So how did cabin crew members organize and resist the process of intensified exploitation of their laboring bodies during that first period of um, the company's renationalization between 2008 and 2015. Um, I'd like to explain briefly this concept of a laboring body that, as I said, is one that we are uh, in the process of debate uh, with my colleague Anne Engelhardt. Um, we know from Marx that labor power is a unique commodity and that the uniqueness of this uh, commodity is that it sets up capitalist production and also that it's a commodity that it's not capitalistically produced. So social reproduction uh, theory or social reproduction feminists uh, expand the understanding of that um, singularity by adding the premise that um, workers, of course, produce wealth in capitalist societies, and they ask the question on how workers are produced and how those two processes are interconnected. We know capitalist systems depend on labor power, uh, human labor power, but it's not just biologically, but mentally, emotionally, and physically uh, labor power and workers that are able to work. Let's say workers' arrival at the gates of the workplaces requires more than a physical existence. He, she, or they need to perform with a set of expected attitudes, uh, values, and, and language. So as uh, another uh, theory, uh, Sebastian Rue explained, well, labor power is not an abstract thing. Rather, it is, and I quote, a socially mediated aggregate of corporeal capacities embedded in and accomplished by a labor body with concrete particularities, end of quote. What we mean by this is that 
None of us live at the gates of our workplaces, our skin color, our gender, our sexuality, or um, any other uh, particular characteristics. So uh, far from ambitioning what we could say uh, biological determinism, um, this perspective tries to highlight how the capacity to work is inseparable from the corporeal and concrete uh, values, meaning that um, the, the commodity legal power only exists in those uh, specific features of the body it inhabits. Thus, um, in following this perspective, um, I understand the experience of workers in relation to their laboring bodies as an experience that is socially and historically uh, produced. And I highlight the experience of workers because there are some processes that cannot be labeled at work-related diseases, such as a daily headache, a physical discomfort, um, constant tiredness. So um, a lot of these experiences are rather overlooked by what I call the mainstream occupational health perspective. And on the other hand, the Latin American social medicine, which uh, in Argentina is mainly um, deployed by um, labor anthropologists gen um, in general, they prefer the concept of health and illness processes to refer to those complex uh, experiences that involve not only um, the legal or medical definitions, but also workers' experience in relation to their labor and body. So, um, to sum up, um, I regard uh, the relationship between the worker-led actions, the union tradition, and this resistance to the intensification um, through this body lens to understand how workers' health and safety uh, is actually a totality in opposition to what I consider a narrow uh, perspective of occupational health. So this, combined with um, the vision of totality that social reproduction theory proposes to understand how capitalism uh, works, but also how it is confronted, resisted, and transformed, um, leads, according to my view, to a wider or a broader analysis of uh, class conflicts. And this framework, I find it useful to integrate this that I will briefly comment, the variety of forms that workers and workers' organizations uh, assume and also, um, I think this could contribute to a discussion on Marx's collective, uh, on Marx's perspective, sorry, on collective action and workers' power. So, um, once again, back to the aim of the presentation, um, I will focus on um, the daily struggles of workers. So, for that purpose, I would like to share with you this very central quote. Um, Pamela, a young worker uh, who started working in Aerolíneas Argentina during the renationalization uh, process, said to me, and I quote, sometimes I'm overwhelmed and I can't sleep. I'd rather be hit over my head to fall asleep. And there are other moments when I can't even wake up. It makes me angry when that happens in my free time, when I've arranged to do something for fun, and I can't wake up. Besides, you know, sleeping during the day is not the same as sleeping at night. It happens when you have a wedding and you may have slept all day, but when you wake up, you're left as a pussy. When you come back from flying, you have that feeling. You sleep until three o'clock in the afternoon and you still get up feeling really bad. End of uh, the quote. So I think this testimony portrays the experience of tiredness and fatigue. Her metaphors are quite clear. Um, and however, um, they are very illustrative to uh, what 
to the point of what they discuss when cabin crew members discuss working and resting time. Because it's not only about their physical and mental health, it's also about their social life or their social health. And I think it also serves as a good example um, to show that kind of experiences that, as I mentioned before, do not fall into the category of occupational health. I mean, um, uh, do you imagine a calling uh, uh, to work and say that um, to your employer that you cannot go because you're tired? In the mainstream occupational health perspective, no recognized medical symptom uh, means no medical leave. So the reason why um, that perspective uh, of um, health illnesses and care processes is really fundamental to understand a worker's body uh, experience. And, and in doing so, I find it that it gives us a better comprehension of the wide variety of actions that workers perform to resist the processes of intensification on their labor bodies. So, utilization um, the public management of Aerolíneas Argentinas actually implemented a set of changes to improve the company after the crisis. Uh, it had um, um, been involved during the private um, administration. And one example of it are the federal corridors. Um, I know the map is not so clear uh, in the image, but it shows how the new policy tried to introduce routes in order that uh, they could connect the country without uh, uh, passengers being obliged to take a flight to Buenos Aires. So uh, this is a uh, great policy that actually incremented the frequency of flights and it also gave more connectivity uh, to the country. But you can imagine that for workers, it just meant intensify the workload. Um, the more stopovers, I will go back to this, um, the more stopovers in each working day means a more takes off and landing. And these are crucial safety moments which require their full attention. And also it increases the exposure to the changes of pressure uh, that impact on the cardiovascular system and on the ears, for instance. But moreover, in each one of those stopovers, they have to take care of passengers at all times. This means that um, in each boarding and disembarkation, they have to count and ensure that all passengers get off in their correct destination. And also each stop with passengers on board means they cannot take a break, they cannot uh, uh, take their shoes off, uh, they cannot chat with co-workers or call their families, um, for instance. So, more stopovers in each working day, uh, as well as an acceleration of the rhythm in order to uh, be able to stick to the shuttles of uh, the airports, increase uh, their workload and as many workers commented to me on the interviews uh, this actually um, was what they call the backside of connectivity and growth policies uh, and of course this is less visible than uh, the struggles for salaries um, or even the conflict in 2012 when the company tried to make a change in the collective agreement and, uh, and to extend working hours. And after the union, the Asociación Argentina de Aeronavigantes uh, rejected uh, that policy and workers refused to do those flights who did not comply with the collective agreements, uh, the company had to turn back on, on the previous two shuttles. So, um, during that period, we can see that in that open conflict, I mean, the one in, in 2012, the company had to go back 
on its policy. But then it was successful in imposing other ways to intensify um, the workload of workers. As I mentioned before, this connectivity policy that increased the workload meant for workers an increase in their workload and so uh, in the levels of fatigue. So two ways to resist or to dispute uh, the task and the times are the actions called not lying expired and not performing as cunning crew chief. Um, the first one is um, the most common workplace, I would say, in aviation or uh, in, for cabin crew members. Um, you may know that the disruption of, of rest uh, is absolute, uh, absolutely uh, important because it reduces their ability to perform correctly um, their security tasks. And current crew knowledge of the collective agreements and the aeronautical aviation regarding working hours um, is fundamental to do the math um, so that they cannot, so that they don't surpass that upper limit. I find interesting that this know-how is learned during their training process. Um, a great majority of workers actually get their training at the union school, but also through their families. And in all cases, before canceling a flight, they always check by telephone with their delegate. Um, so before they inform the company and the pilot in command that they will not do that flight, they always get that support uh, on the telephone. So as work and shuttles are not the same for all cabin crew workers, this is a decision that they sometimes have to do on their own. So again, to say no, the presence of the union through that telephone call, or I would say a telephone endorsement, uh, and their support of their co-workers are fundamental for them to uh, call off the flight. And we can all imagine that refusing to do a certain task uh, uh, is difficult for all workers. And female coming crew workers may have it a little bit harder when they're not direct boss, but the maximum authority of the plane is a pilot uh, in command, which is usually entailed in a military uh, tradition. And another key element is that every time a flight is cancelled, potentially angry passengers can become a burden for those co-workers who actually stay um, on the flight. So um, another uh, of the most uh, common actions that workers refer to me as a habit is not performing as a cabin crew chief. In um, Argentina, the cab in Aerolinas Argentina, sorry, the cabin crew uh, chief is a different category than the rest of the cabin crew. So this means that legally any worker, any cabin crew worker with a license could perform this task, but uh, if the cabin crew chief is delayed or fails to arrive, the company has to replace that worker with another of the same category. But sometimes uh, in this rush, you know, to get to the shuttle, the, the company supervisors ask workers to perform as cabin crew chief. And it is the habit of most workers not uh, to take that responsibility because otherwise, they, will, they would be accepting a kind of flexibilization of their collective um, agreement. So um, for those workers who enter the company in the regionalized phase, um, they acknowledge how this has been in the past um, because of the testimonies of their families or other co-workers with different activist um, backgrounds. So um, as in the above mentioned uh, example of not flying uh, expired, this also requires uh, special knowledge 
on the collective uh, agreements, when all in all, it's not just a legal issue, but a tradition, one that they learn from their family members who resisted this process during um, the period of the privatization. And as some workers commented, back then, the company managed to impose um, a de facto multitasking team by closing the possibilities of promotion. And so, as it was not guaranteed that each flight would, would have uh, their crew chief, the cabin crew workers had to take uh, the responsibility of that uh, supervisory task without being paid for it. So, in an international context uh, in which the tendency to work more hours and inflexible shifts, uh, as I mentioned before, these uh, um, actions um, to resist the changes that the company can introduce rather uh, in an indirect way. Um, are vital to understand the everyday struggles of uh, workers' work systems. Um, the company, then, uh, as I mentioned before, this is the the, the flag that uh, the worker uh, was uh, was holding in the manifestation. So, what is important uh, to highlight in this matter is that I find the union tradition in this everyday uh, struggles, as I said before, through the delegate support, through the knowledge of collective agreements, um, to the concrete reference to past struggles, as well as to the um, important uh, defense of safety uh, and flight safety related to their own uh, working conditions. So, one of the workers uh, mentioned, and I will quote Marcelo, another young worker, who said, the company bets that you will break down. Then you leave, and then they hire someone else. That is the company's bet. Deep down, the company doesn't want cabin crew members who work for a long time. This happens a lot in Aerolíneas, Argentina. The company is basing itself on other guidelines of international companies in which they have a constant change of cabin crew members. So we can imagine that those other guidelines associated with productivity and effectiveness and high standard service are key elements uh, um, that the company actually tried uh, to introduce during the renationalization process. And um, as I briefly mentioned in the beginning, this was particularly uh, resisted by workers in an open conflict in 2012. Nevertheless, uh, we see that the company succeeded in imposing changes in the working conditions through the reorganization of the flights, driven by the federal corridor of policy. Um, so when this led to production rhythms uh, acceleration, cabin crews rejected performing as cabin crews um, to resist that form of polyvalence or multitasking, one that they know that was implemented during the privatization. So what I find interesting is that this consensus of cabin crew workers not to allow that possibility uh, is also a way to reject that the renationalized company in a company that they understand is a, co a public company that belongs to all and um, cannot go back into the policies of the privatized uh, moment. So again, how did cabin crew members organize and resist it? As I said before, by uh, putting into action knowledge, practices, and actions that are part of their union tradition, but not directly driven by the union officials. So if I still have your attention, uh, uh, a little bit of what would be the final reflections on these processes, um, that I try to uh, briefly um, summarize. 
So these forms of workplace organization to dispute uh, the workers, um, sorry, the working hours and, and the tasks, put into practice uh, the union action. And as I said, it also means a dispute over the meaning of the renationalized company. So the knowledge of their labor rights related to working hours, the support of delegates and their habits are elements of daily disputes over time and past. Um, we can say that the dispute over time to reduce the levels of fatigue is one that puts their own safety um, as a precondition to warrant the flight's safety. And this is part of the union tradition, which has historically um, disputed the working conditions as a dispute of the flight safety. Um, I did not expand on this in the presentation, but this can be found in all union documents, in the public discourses, uh, and the institutional actions for Argentinian aviation unions have built a strong tradition based on international safety and security uh, standards in which they have confronted with the company, let's say, in a, a similar language. Because um, without a safe flight, no airlines sell tickets. So industrial safety is vital. So what unions have historically disputed is that actually that safety can only be guaranteed if the labor rights are guaranteed. Simply put, um, not being able to perform their security role is um, a risk not only to them, but to passengers. And that's because the lives of everyone is at stake if they have not slept correctly and if they are not fully concentrated. So having crew members organized and resisted these processes during this first period of renationalization, as I said, by engaging in union action, when the conflict scale, as the company tried to reinterpret the collective agreement, but they also resisted by rejecting tasks through actions that are not open or direct conflict with the company, but that they all involve this special uh, knowledge and specific knowledge uh, of the union tradition. It's also a form of dispute over the renationalized uh, company as a public service and as a victory of the organized labor movement. So a public company, in their view, cannot replicate the privatization model. And the knowledge of labor rights related to working hours, uh, the support of their delegates, uh, become crucial uh, in those moments to reject the task. And, and also, I would like to finish this presentation by saying that, in conclusion, we can see that the labor body is just one, and that um, this evident fact should not be overlooked when collective actions are analyzed. So um, I aim to approach then um, a perspective on union power that is able to capture, at least in this case, how the union tradition is a result of specific forms of uh, social reproduction processes at the workplaces, in their own families, and uh, in the training uh, institutions. So when social reproduction as, um, is understood as a, a totality uh, or as a total terrain of a class struggle, some of what we would call the non-traditional industrial actions or these small gains on times and tasks can be seen not only as a dispute on labor rights at the workplace, uh, but also um, uh, to the right to enjoy life. I finished by saying then that as it is um, sleeping without a hit in the head. 
and resisting flexibilization are equally important in the process of resisting the wearing of uh, labor and bags. So I would leave it up to here and I would like to thank you all again and I would be very glad to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this very interesting and insightful presentation. Um, I mean, I, I feel very close to my niece is a flat attendant, so it's very interesting you know, to see the similarities in between, you know, what's happening everywhere when it comes to the industry. So I think we are open for questions and comments. Um, if you have something, please type it on the chat. Uh, meanwhile, perhaps I can kickstart the discussion, Sarah. I mean, um, it, it seems to me this concept of laboring bodies is very much in line with the labor process theory of Braverman, right? And, and I wanted to know if you could discuss a bit more that whether, how is it different, you know, this perspective that you are putting of social production theory and labor anthropology from what Braverman has actually uh, been discussing. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the question. Well, I think that um, what, what I found more interesting about trying to combine these two perspectives, um, mainly the perspective of um, labor anthropologists that uh, in Argentina, they have worked or they have deployed uh, the tradition of the Latin American social medicine uh, perspective uh, with uh, the, the Marxist analysis of uh, social reproduction theory. Um, for me, that combination is important in, math, in terms of trying to understand the process in its totality and its complexity. So, of course, that uh, the processes or the or the idea of the impact of the labor process organization on workers' health is uh, important. And I will not um, say that all the uh, research on occupational health and safety uh, does not bear uh, fruit because, of course, that identifying um, the risks um, that or the hazards of certain labor processes to workers is vital. But what I find is that sometimes um, those perspectives um, are not enough, for instance, uh, to address the problem of fatigue, as in this case, where workers experience different types um, of, um, of symptoms or, or let's say illnesses or malady or, or maladies that do not strictly fall into that category. So what I think that the perspective of social um, Latin American medicine brings to us is the idea that the workers experience of their of their laboring bodies is more complex that one, what actually can be leveled in the uh, occupational health um, list, you know, of illnesses. And on the other side, that idea uh, of experience is very important also uh, from the perspective of social reproduction uh, theory to understand that these health and uh, processes do not just occur to workers, but that workers actually take actions and they care for their health in a variety of forms. Sometimes uh, calling on medical leave and making use of their labor rights, but in other cases, trying to resist or to mitigate those effects by involving in these actions that I uh, explained, which of course do not change the organization of the labor process, but at least give them um, the possibility to resist uh, that wearing of their laboring bodies in these very um, processes of intensification of their workload. Thank you very much for that. So we have two questions. We have one from 
Carlos in the chat section uh, and is asking whether you could actually extend the argument that um, labor embodies just one and how does that relate to the discussions on gender and section, intersectional perspectives in your analysis? And we have another one in the, but perhaps uh, shall we get it one by one? Do you want to get Carlos first? Uh, yeah, I, I was reading one on, on the chat and it was different to the one that you mentioned. Uh, can you please repeat the one you said? So I answer yes, them. Of course. So uh, the one that I read was from Carlos and uh, he wanted to expand a bit more on the laboring body as just one. Uh -huh. And, and how is the gender intersectional perspective analysis, uh, you know, reflected in, in this uh, perspective? Perfect. Thanks for that question, Carlos. Um, the idea of the laboring body as one, uh, in the way I've mentioned it, means that uh, workers do not leave their bodies uh, at the workplaces, nor they leave it at home when they are on the plane. So I think um, the idea of understanding it as one may help us to understand, for instance, why sometimes uh, the workers uh, would actually involve uh, in collective action or they will um, uh, agree with their co-workers that they will not do that flight if they are expired. Uh, and, but in other cases, uh, it could be that workers just agree to speed up the labor process so that they can close doors, live in the plane and take off and do not, um, uh, I would say, uh, and do not uh, do uh, what's uh, expected from them to do. That is, if you are expired, you cannot uh, get on the plane. So sometimes they just speed up to actually get on the flight without being expired because they want to go back home. As one of the workers mentioned, she feels really bad when she misses her social life because uh, of her work. So the idea of making it one means that also um, uh, workers um, participate in different actions and in different processes of uh, learning and of struggling that happen at the workplaces, but also in their homes and also uh, in their families. Not only the, um, the worker that I showed with the um, T-shirt of her mother, but also uh, Kevin crew members who um, talk to other members of their family who are part of the aviation um, collective, but maybe they are not Kevin crews. And that way they get involved into that tradition. And I, I think that the discussion with the intersectionality um, perspective is a, a very interesting. I think we may not have time to go through that um, uh, in deeply, but uh, I think that social reproduction theory uh, recognizes that, of course, that there are different uh, identities and that there are different, um, I would say, characteristics of uh, workers. But their debate or our debate with intersectionality is that for social reproduction uh, feminism, there is one cause for that multiple, multiple ways of, of oppression. And that explanation is the capitalist mode of production. Um, well, I, I just tried to summarize the answer, but we can, of course, continue on the debate on this point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. There, there was a, I, I thought you were reading the question from Dara Golden, right? Mm -hmm. About, and that's also quite interesting because, I mean, of course, uh, getting staff requires certain training. So the fact that the worker is saying that, you know, the cabin, the, the employer doesn't really want to have for a long time this uh, flight attendant is quite interesting. So I think that's what Derek is also ask, um, asking about uh, this constant change in cabin crew. Um, perhaps as a way of breaking the resolve of the cabin crew. Um, but is there really an, uh, such a big labor pool of uh, flight attendants that they can easily, you know, be used, uh, uh, utilized by the companies? Yeah, that's an excellent uh, question. 
Uh, back in the moment of, of this research, I would say that there was not such a pool uh, of workers. And that actually what one of the workers mentioned is that the company tried to align with those uh, international policies of other companies, such as uh, local companies and Ryanair, where there is a constant change of uh, the workforce. In Ireland and Argentina, that is not the case. Workers tend to uh, stay for long periods of time. And many of the workers that I interviewed, they actually um, stay for commented to me how they ended up staying longer than, uh, than what they expect, expected. Nowadays, I think that situation has changed, especially because during 2020 in Argentina, uh, the other um, great uh, company, which is a private company, LATAM or LATAM Airlines, as you may know it, um, and dismissed about 117 uh, workers as it decided from one day to another to close operations in the country. Uh, so nowadays, there is uh, actually um, a greater pool of, of very qualified workers that could, um, in a way or, or, or another, be considered a, a pool of workers that could replace uh, in case um, that this wearing of the laboring bodies extended. But it was not the case uh, back at that moment. Interesting. And we have a question also from, um, I can't see the name, who's the, or oh, is it Florian? Okay. <laughs> Um, are there any major global cabin crew unions or initiatives to improve working conditions? And, and since uh, we are um, approaching towards the end, if you can tell us a bit more about what happened. I mean, it seems that the union was not there present, but somehow was there, both in collective memory, but also in the infrastructure it has created, you know, when it comes to collective agreements and so on. So if you can tell us a bit, uh, how then did the official unions come in, if ever, and perhaps connect the two questions more broadly about the industry. Right. Um, yeah, I will address Florian's questions first. Uh, there, um, there are, um, of course, international uh, coming groups uh, organizations Patients and most of uh, the, the, the most uh, relevant one is uh, the, um, inside the ITF uh, and especially in Latin America. There is this network, uh, the LATAM uh, network, uh, which is, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, LATAM Airlines is another uh, great, uh, it was another great competitor of Airlines Argentina in the domestic market. Um, and in Latin America, it is actually uh, one of the greatest uh, companies. And, and it's, I think that the process or, or the alliances that the very different national unions uh, started uh, was a vital element to resist that company's um, in, uh, attempts to you know, put workers against workers in the collective negotiation. Basically, uh, LATAM in each country threatened the workers that if they did not accept uh, those conditions, then they would move the operations to another country. So to contrast that power, I think the LATAM network was vital. Uh, but and even in that network, there were members of the national uh, unions in uh, union, sorry. Uh, in Argentina, but it was more related to the case of LATAM than this one. Uh, and then um, a lot of, of course, the aviation, uh, sorry, aviation union leaders of the other unions, not not this one only, have a very important element in ITF uh, in uh, in, the, in different uh, roles, and they also uh, participate. Uh, in, in the congresses. Um, and now to address uh, Adlira's question on, on, on the official union, I, I think that what is uh, interesting is actually how the union power here is present, even though the union is as an institution, we could say, is not directly present. And I did not expand on, on the conflict of uh, 2012, but in that moment where the company 
I actually tried to violate the collective agreements. Uh, the union organization was vital to assist that process and workers rejected those flights. And I think that the, the of course, that the, the union power in the Argentinian case is a whole uh, other debate. And it's um, uh, what I would like to highlight is that the official unions uh, have a greater role and they have had, um, I think, a, a vital role in the process of um, actually turning uh, the original project of the government to renationalize and privatize the company again to actually make it a state-owned company. That's it. Uh, in, in 2008, uh, when the government had uh, to face the crisis uh, of the company, the original project was not to make it again a renationalized airline, but to just uh, expropriate um, the shares and then sell it to another private uh, stakeholder. And the official unions putting uh, their own resources in the streets and also in negotiation processes uh, were the ones who actually uh, made uh, it possible. So yes, answering to your question, the official unions are very present. Um, I just wanted to highlight how I, I found interesting this idea of the union tradition being present, even though uh, it was uh, not uh, in actions directly uh, organized by the union. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. If there is any burning question, please feel free to make it now. But if not, uh, Sarah, if you can just perhaps really wrapping up, I mean, it's so interesting, the whole conversation, particularly, I think the context is so important when you have a vibrant trade union movement with all its problems, the fact that there is a context of successful union organizing, successful stories, a collective agreement, it does make a difference uh, in, in supporting um, collective mobilizations, even in places where perhaps there is not straightforward a union, a union existing in, in the workplace. That's really great. But if you could tell us perhaps at the end, how did the COVID-19 kind of affect, you know, <laughs> these dynamics? And what can you say? I mean, on the one hand, you could expect that there has been even a more intensification of perhaps even more health hazards for these workers. On the other, did it increase their um, um, bargaining power? Or if you could just tell us what happened during that period. Yeah, that, that's the question uh, uh, of, of nowadays. So thank you, Lyra, for, for bringing it in. Um, well, on the one hand, I think that the idea that we have with uh, COVID-19 is that aviation absolutely, that was absolutely uh, stopped during the pandemic. And this is something that I discussed with other um, union leaders in, in the GLUE conference uh, very recently, where they said that actually uh, the world kept on going on. I mean, there were not commercial flights, but all the freight flights, all the vaccines, how do we imagine they travel through, through the world? And so what they say is that in the aviation sector, for some workers, it actually increased their workload uh, and increased the hazards. For instance, um, if we think of the air controllers, you know, the, the, those workers uh, at the towers who control the planes uh, and movement around the world, for those workers, uh, the pandemic did not mean a stop at any point. And actually, um, in Argentina, that gave them a great bargaining um, power that allowed them last year to get one of the best salary negotiations uh, in the country. But for other workers, let's say, for instance, the outsourced uh, workers of security, uh, which are you know, in the bottom of, of the hierarchy of, of workers, uh, they just uh, they, they had to resist um, not only uh, the increase of the workload, but 
in the very beginning of the pandemic, they were forced to work with no protocols. The outsourced companies did not give them the accurate um, health and safety protections. And when they resisted that, uh, some of them were dismissed and they had uh, they, and they involved in certain different strikes until their co-workers were uh, rinsed out. And I think that in the case of uh, cabin crew workers, uh, what was um, uh, very um, important, I would say, is that also at the beginning, they were not given any uh, protection. Uh, they uh, had to bring their own masks and their sanitizers. Also, they worked, you know, that the flights during the pandemic, the repatriation flights to bring back citizens. They were all flights uh, that were made non-stop. That means instead of working 12 or 13 hours, they got in flights that just did, I would say, Buenos Aires, London, and London back with two groups of crews, but they actually worked for two days uh, on a round. And it was um, a process in which also the company did not train workers in what to do with um, these passengers that no one actually knew how people would react. You know, um, cabin crews are really trained to deal with what they call disruptive passengers. But the COVID-19 uh, made it uh, so difficult to see, to identify how people uh, would react. And the last comment on, on this is that the result uh, of, at least in Argentina, the result of this uh, um, discussion on, on the workload that the, the company could not introduce in that conflict I mentioned in 2012, and the company tried to change the collective agreement and uh, it had to go back. Well, in 2020, the, co the, the, the solution was that the president uh, introduced a legal reform to a decree to actually change uh, the maximum hours of, of flights, um, of, sorry, of cabin crews. So it's interesting how the pandemic uh, in, in very different ways also allowed these uh, shifts uh, to more, more or to even more um, intensified processes. Um, and that's uh, all so far. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for also providing this inspiring story. I mean, despite the discourses around saying there is no more organized labor, we see again and again stories of resistance. And thank you for giving voice to those stories and for sharing with us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and for your questions and comments. Um, we hope to see you around again. And uh, yes, on behalf of the ICDB, uh, thanks a lot for joining us and see you in other conversations. Take care, everyone.